Deve agus fáilte go lá na crita. Welcome to National Harp Day 2020. For the last few years, National Harp Day has been a wonderful opportunity to celebrate harping in Ireland, to marvel at the virtuosity of the professionals who play harp and to take pride in the next generation of players. This day is also an opportunity to remember and acknowledge the contribution of pioneering harp players from previous generations who played a pivotal role in the development and popularisation of the harp in Ireland and abroad. Our short talk today focuses on the musical collaborations for Irish harp of Grania Yates and the composer Brian Boydell. In 1961, Brian Boydell commenced the composition of four sketches for two Irish harps, Opus 52, which was the first of five works he composed for Irish harp or harps. In preparation for the composition of the four sketches, Boydell borrowed a modern Irish harp. It was evident from this first encounter with a modern Irish harp that composing for the instrument would be a challenge. The instrument is chromatically limited and until the 1960s the modern Irish harp was not considered to be an instrument suited to the performance of contemporary music. But what attracted Boydell to the Irish harp in the 1960s? In an interview in 2005, Boydell's son Barra commented, quote, If it weren't for Grania Yates, the Irish harp would never have entered my father's sound world. I think he had really little or no interest in Irish music. He slightly disdained it, but occasionally drew on it on a subconscious level. So the fact that he did write for Irish harp was definitely Grania's influence." End quote. Grania Yates commissioned Boydell and many of his contemporaries to compose for Irish harp in various guises in the 1960s and 70s and she was largely responsible for premiering these compositions and performing the works nationally and internationally. The first professional collaboration of Boydell and Yates was in December 1958, when she was engaged as a soloist for performances of Handel's Messiah with Trinity College Dublin's Choral Society. The performances were directed by Joseph Gruco and Boydell played oboe in the orchestra. Yeats's performances were well received, but perhaps more significantly for Boydell and Yeats, it initiated a professional relationship and a close personal friendship between their families, which spanned four decades. Grania Yeats, nay Ni Hegertig, was born in April 1925. Regarded as a pioneer in the harping world in Ireland in the latter half of the 20th century, she was a harper, singer, teacher, arranger, historian, academic, founder member of Corda Nacrita, Friends of the Harp, and is credited with reviving the centuries-old practice of wire-strung Irish harp performance. She studied history at Trinity College Dublin and was an active member of the Historical Society, where she met Michael Yates, whom she married in 1949. After her studies, she focused on piano and voice lessons at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. In 1959, Yates became a member of the Dowland Consort, a semi-professional vocal ensemble founded and directed by Brian Boydell. The consort performed regularly together, both nationally and internationally, and made numerous broadcasts on RTE and BBC from 1959 to 1969. Although vocal music of the Renaissance and Baroque periods dominated their concert programmes, Boydell often included a section with three or four Irish songs sung by Yeats or Thomas O'Sullivan with Irish harp accompaniment. In 1959, Boydell dedicated his Sheil Martin Suite to Yeats, and he chaired many of her Arts Council funded lectures on the history of the harp in 1963. Most importantly, he introduced her to other contemporary composers who composed and or arranged works for her. 
She, in turn, introduced these composers to the music of renowned harpers such as Turlico Carlin, Cornelius Lyons and Thomas and William Canellan. Yeats's commissioning of contemporary works was a vital step in the evolution of music for the modern Irish harp in the 1960s. Yeats, along with fellow harpist Mercedes Bolger, commissioned Boydell to write the four sketches for two Irish harps in 1961, and they performed it at a seminal recital entitled My Gentle Harp at the Ablana Theatre in March 1962, along with newly composed pieces by Ruth Mervyn and T.C. Kelly. To say this evening was a defining moment in the history of the Irish harp in the 20th century is not an exaggeration. The premiering of works by contemporary Irish composers changed the perception of the modern Irish harp and introduced the instrument to audiences and composers who hitherto had shown no interest in it. In fact, when the sketches were later performed as part of the Royal Irish Academy of Music's recital series in February 1964, the critic Charles Acton commented in his review, quote, the first two sketches in particular remain outstanding and a real pioneering contribution to a fascinating medium. They should be a spur and a challenge to other composers such as Shor Shabadli and Sean O'Reilly." So what made the sketches so original? Quite simply, by treating two Irish harps as one fully chromatic instrument, Boydell extended the palette of pitches available to him. The two harps became a blank musical canvas which was stripped of any musical or cultural connections with Irish folk music or traditional harp repertoire played on wire strung or modern Irish harps. The four movements are varied in character and tempo, but unified in terms of compositional techniques.
sketches, which we just performed, is in ternary form and is essentially a playful musical dialogue between the harps. The second sketch provides a stark harmonic and rhythmic contrast to the first movement and the use of polymeter creates an interesting rhythmic tension between the parts. Considering the originality of the first two movements, number three is disappointingly diatonic. The movement seems out of place in the overall work, probably because it was adapted from an existing piece, namely Dance for an Ancient Ritual composed for solo piano in 1959. The final sketch is intended as a musical parody. The four sketches set the standard for the employment of the Irish harp as an instrument of art music for other composers. Critics who attended the premiere of the work in 1962 were astounded by the originality of Boydell's work. In the Irish press, the critic commented that, quote, from the first commanding bar to the sardonic last, here was music that surprised and delighted the ear. Dr. Boydell's inventiveness, his fresh and sprightly ideas have never been better displayed in the sketches." End quote. Boydell had produced a work that successfully explored aspects of chromaticism on the Irish harp, albeit by combining two Irish harps. In 1965, Yeats challenged Boydell to create a work that would push the boundaries of the instrument even further. To mark the centenary of William Butler Yeats's birth, she commissioned him to set some of her father-in-law's poetry for soprano and Irish harp. The result was three Yeats songs, Opus 56A, undoubtedly the most complex piece ever written for a singer harpist. Yeats premiered the work on the 24th of March, 1966, at the Abbey Lecture Theatre Hall, Dublin. The three poems by Yeats, which Boydell chose to set to music, are from collections published over 13 years. A Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven is from the collection The Wind Among the Reeds, a drinking song from The Green Helmet and Other Poems, and Red Hanrahan's Song About Ireland from In the Seven Woods. It is not clear whether Grony Yeats suggested the poems to Boydell or whether he chose the texts. In any case, the three poems are meditations on the theme of love, both human and patriotic. The text is of primary importance in these songs and the harp accompaniment is subservient to the vocal part. At the beginning of each song, Boydell indicates a specific tuning for the harp in each octave. The remaining unavailable chromatic pitches are generally incorporated into the vocal part, thus facilitating complete chromaticism from the harpist singer. The first song, He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven, is based on one of Yeats's most popular poems. The immortal line, Tread softly because you tread on my dreams, has been set to music by many composers over the years. The second song, a drinking song, appears initially to be an inconsequential piece. One might expect to hear a typical Irish drinking song, such as Prabs and Ole. But from the opening bars of the accompaniment, it is clear that Boydell has no desire to present an idiomatic Irish piece in 6-8 time. The final song is Red Hanrahan's Song About Ireland. Kathleen the Houlihan, the powerful mythic symbol of Irish nationalism, is the central character in this song. Boydell set this poem about the protagonist in a dramatic, elaborate, recitative style, with the harp generally used to mark an important word in the vocal line or to fill moments of silence between phrases. Mary Louise will now perform the second of Boydell's three eight songs, a drinking song.
Adele's three Yates songs featured regularly at Grawny Yates' concerts in the 1960s and 70s, in particular in North America and Japan. Unfortunately, the three Yates songs have rarely been performed over the last three decades, and this is largely due to the complexity of the work. Boydell did not compose again for the harp for over two decades until he was commissioned by Theresa Lawler with a grant from the Arts Council of Ireland to compose an album of pieces for the Irish harp. The work was premiered at the National Concert Hall on the 23rd of April 1990. Boydell's attitude to the Irish harp and his approach to composing for the instrument had changed significantly from the 1960s. Composing for solo Irish harp was a challenge, but also a compromise. Without a second harp or a voice to articulate his musical language, he had to simplify his compositional style and produce a work that could not push the boundaries of contemporary music on the Irish harp any further. Four sketches for two Irish harps and three Yeats songs, however, are firmly embedded in a golden age of composition for the Irish harp. From 1961 until the publication of the Irish Harp Book in 1975, Grania Yeats regularly commissioned contemporary composers to write for Irish harp duo, Irish harp solo or voice to harp accompaniment. Joseph Gruco's Three Pieces for Voice and Harp Alois Fleischmann's The Poet's Circuits and many other works were premiered by Yeats. This inspired period of musical creativity and innovation has yet to be surpassed in the history of the modern Irish harp tradition. Ta Sulaguin Gervinship Tanev Os Shin Slan Agus Benach. Dear Gwich, August Falter of Galer, good day on Cade, Lorna Quita, in Sydney. You are all very welcome today to the first Irish Harp Day in Sydney. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you. Uh, I am Owen Feeney, Ireland's Consul General to New South Wales, uh, and I'd like at the outset to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, and to pay my respects on behalf of the Irish Government to their elders past, present and future. The, what we are hoping to offer you today is a little bit of escapism. This has been a horrible year. It's the first time we've organised an event since we cancelled St Patrick's Day back in March. So it's really exciting for myself and the team at the Consulate to be here today with you. And as I said, we hope to offer you a little bit of escapism, maybe an antidote to what's going on. Uh, right now in the world. We're going to introduce you to something called harp therapy today. So what I would encourage you to do is to relax and enjoy the next hour. Forget everything that's going on outside. That said, I have to remind you to respect social distancing. You've all signed in when you arrived. We have hand sanitizer at the check-in station here. It's more here. So maintain social distancing, please. Uh, and uh, we'll all have a wonderful event today. When the wonderful Kleena Mullins approached the consulate and said that she would like to mark Ireland's National Harp Day here in Sydney, I thought, wow, why haven't we done that before? There are people all over the world uh, and across Ireland marking our Harp Day, which actually falls tomorrow. And we thought about where would be a nice place to celebrate Ireland's beautiful uh, instrument, uh, the harp. And we said, the Botanic Gardens, it has to be the gardens. And the day that we came down here to scope it out, it was raining cats and dogs. And it was raining so heavily it would have given Ireland a run for its money. Uh, and we said, well, it definitely can't rain on the day of Harp Day. And of course, I woke up this morning and the sky was looking grey and very Irish. Uh, but what a wonderful plan B we have in this venue. And thank you to the team at the, at the gardens uh, for accommodating us here.
where words end and fail, music speaks. How true that saying is. In a hospital, there are so often no words. A family tragedy, illness, pain. The music empathically reflects the emotion of the moment. It says, I am here with you. It is sad and deep. It says it's okay. It's okay to be sad. I am here with you in your suffering. I feel your pain. But with a change of mode, the music can also say it's okay to look up again. It's okay to look to tomorrow and hope for a brighter future. incredible um, to see such beautiful instruments, six such beautiful instruments played so beautifully. So thank you all. Uh, I like that's just 
wonderful and uh, just uh, it was so such an escape from everything that's going on I think you'll agree uh, so thank you to our wonderfully talented musicians for really treating us today with such a beautiful performance thank you all so much could I get a round of applause for the musicians again please?
everyone, my name is Grace Lee and I am from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Huge shout out to Harp Ireland for making this awesome online event happen. And the tune I'm going to play for you today is O Carolyn's Cup. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy.
My name is Mona Akram and I've been playing the harp for a year. Um, I'd like to take part in the old Carolyn Challenge and this arrangement is called Amelia's Lullaby. Thank you very much.
Hello, Bahrain. Hi, everybody. It's great uh, to be part of Law Macrita Harp Day. And I've got Law Hawkrit as well. I have two harps with me my grandmother's harp here and my own. Um, my grandmother was uh, a wonderful woman called Rogine Nihay, and her sister, Marlene Nihay, was known as uh, Mrs. Ferreter to many. She was the harp teacher in Sion Hill for a long time. And uh, many of her students now, you know their names. You know Mary O'Hara, you know Kathleen Watkins, you know Janet Harbison, all these wonderful, wonderful performers and teachers and singers. And uh, Maureen, my aunt, my grand aunt, Maureen was their teacher, and Rogine was my teacher. So I'm lucky to come from a wonderful family of harpers. I took it for granted. There was a harp. This harp was in the corner uh, when I was a child, and my, I, every memory I have of, of uh, growing up involves some kind of music on both sides of the family. But um, I luckily have been able to keep the harp going myself. Um, but I suppose I'd, I'd tell you a little about the, the sisters first. Um, I'm doing a, some research on them at the moment, so I'm, it's. it's great to get a chance to uh, share some of this uh, information and some of the family history that we've been working up together. So, first of all, they were from Dublin, believe it or not. Uh, the O'Shea's originally came from Cork, but uh, Maureen and Rogine were two of uh, five sisters, and they all played the harp, and they all learned from a woman called Caroline Townsend, who came from Cork, apparently, but uh, was, a, was a wonderful, inspiring teacher. She taught them the love of uh, singing uh, songs in Irish with the harp. And that was my grandmother's big passion and Marlene's big passion too, was that people would sing uh, songs in Irish with the harp. And um, actually, it was my big rebellion as a child. I never did sing with the harp at all. But uh, as they went, as Marlene was lost and then my grandmother was um, in her last few years, uh, the importance of what they were trying to say finally clicked in, you know, that uh, if you don't keep them going, who will? So really, um, I guess they were, they were growing up in a Dublin, a very different Dublin to us. Uh, it was a time when, I suppose, 
uh, it was the new state, the Free State was just founded and they were these young girls from Dundrum who played the harp and spoke Irish at home. Um, an oddity, a rare thing in Dublin in those days, it still is, but um, we did the same. But their love of, I guess, of singing really with the harp was what, what they passed on to others and I know um, any evening in their house uh, in, in Clonsky when I was growing up, my grandparents would have uh, sessions and there'd be people in from Brittany and from Wales and they'd all be joining in in different songs and the harp always figured. So um, I was I'll do first I'll do a tune for you that I um, that I learned as much. She was my grandmother was my inspiration as well as everything else and she arranged this piece for me for the Fesh Kyoi back in I guess 1989 or 1990 probably. Anyway, it's Mr. O'Connor. Many of you, if anyone heard me play a tune, you know me, Mr. O'Connor is my tune. But this came actually from an arrangement that my grandmother uh, sketched out, and then she handed me the sketch. It was now so she wanted me to work with my my written uh, my, my written uh, music, and it was something I would always avoid because I was learning everything by ear, and uh, she'd always try and make you read it as well. But as well as you know, she'd teach it to me first by ear, and her method was always to pass it on that way first, and then try and make you read but anyway this is a piece that uh, has been with me it's my good luck charm I always call it and it's called Mr O'Connor <laughs> start a concert with or I, I'm like kind of a good luck charm when I get somewhere but um, that all started really I guess back in the in the late 80s when I was just starting off and I'd go up to my grandmother every every Friday after school and Sunday after mass dutifully to learn and uh, she was a great teacher in that she'd never force anything and she'd always watch to see what people were, were interested in and then she'd kind of coax it out of them. I used to see her teaching other students and I'd watch her um, she'd just ask them what they'd what the, you know what she'd watch them react to different pieces and she'd always 
talk to them in Irish first, and if they didn't respond in Irish, then she'd switch to English or French or Breton or Welsh or whatever, because she spoke all those languages. And I used to see the same with Auntie Maureen when I'd go to visit her. She, she lived up in Goldstown, and you'd go up and uh, if you catch her when there was a student there, it would always be a, a song, of course, or two songs. She'd always drag you in to play you something, and I, her favourite piece was Thudum Bala by Rui Dal Lokai. And uh, I remember uh, she had nine harps, and I had no harps at home at the time. I now have nine harps, it must be a family trait. <laughs> but um, I used to go up and uh, play uh, Thudum Bala for her every every week that I get a chance to treat in, in the hopes of uh, procuring a harp, which worked after about a year. She had a, a little Joe Porter harp, uh, sort of modelled after the Dan Quinn, John Quinn harps in Dublin. But uh, it wasn't her favourite harp, but it was mine, because it didn't have only 31 strings, it didn't have the bass uh, D and E at the bottom. But anyway, uh, it was a great uh, ploy, it worked in the end for me, so I got my little harp out of it. Um, and through them the law, of course, was a, was a staple, you know, everybody, it's in the repertoire for everybody. So I'll spare you that and I'll leave that to your own imagination. But uh, the, one of the songs that I, I was thinking of, um, that I hadn't thought about in ages, till thinking about uh, what I'd say, Erlom uh, Kritchev, was a song that toward the end of Rogine's life, uh, she didn't uh, play too much. She would play the odd time and she loved playing, but uh, when she was called upon to sing, I'd be drafted in to do uh, the accompaniment on the harp. And a piece called Krishdam I Nailed was, uh, was the party piece we worked up for a long time together. Um, it's another one of those, uh, those songs of, of uh, lost love where the man promises to meet the woman somewhere, the girl is left standing waiting, and uh, there's no sign of him, you know. And he promised to meet her and then he never showed up. Typical. These stories still go on today, but uh, anyway, so this, is, this is our version of this. But Rogine is missing, but uh, I thought uh, I think she taught me the words, hoping that I would eventually sing it sometime. Um, I just wish I had sung it when she was alive, you know, but I didn't. So uh, some little regrets, but I'm glad to be doing it now. And um, I haven't played this in ages, so this is Kushlam in <laughs> It's a song I haven't sung in ages, my goodness. Anyway, but as I was singing that, I was just thinking back to some, some uh, little anecdotes about the, about the O'Shea sisters, and one came to mind, uh, a wonderful force in the, in the harp world, a man called Tom Maher, Colm O'Maher's dad, the late Colm, the wonderful harp maker. But I remember once in Mullingar, when they set up a, a, a branch of Coed and the Critter in Mullingar, and I was down, and 
Tom Maher came up to me and says, do you know that I walked up to your grandmother's front door in 1942 and I asked the O'Shea sisters to, uh, to play to commemorate the 150th anniversary of uh, the Belfast Harp Festival, the Harp uh, Gathering in 1972. And um, it was an image because of course the there were telephones but not everybody had one and I could just see this brazen young uh, Tom Maher, he was in the, in the Irish Army and he'd up to the front door of uh, they lived in, in a place called Corcovina, named after the district or the region rather down in, in County Kerry, the Gaeltacht region. But uh, this was a house called Corcovina in uh, Dundrum in Dublin. And uh, it was had a lovely avenue and it had, I believe it had chickens and a, a little farmyard and everything. And uh, I never saw it. It was gone, sadly, before we, we ever came along. But um, the house would have been full of uh, various different, um, I suppose, uh, characters along the way. I know... My grandmother spoke of the smoke of the soiree d'almig. They used to have a, a gathering every Sunday uh, when they were children, they were, I guess, teenagers. And uh, Rogine played the harp and the piano as well, uh, the concert piano, concert uh, repertoire, classical piano repertoire, and they would sing. And the other sisters, Niamh and Mola and Nessa, would also um, sing and play the harp as well. But they were all, um, I think, Niamh and uh, Mola and uh, Nessa decided to sort of sideline the harp in the end. But uh, Mardine and Ness and Rogine, my grandmother, were the two who stuck with it. Um, I suppose, you know, not everybody can be a harp player all the time. You, your passions are elsewhere, but I know Mardine's passion was in teaching in the end, and Rogine's was in travelling. So you'd see uh, Mardine, and I know she went off to, to London with uh, Mary O'Hara and my grandmother to uh, perform together, the three of them. And uh, then I think Mardine's uh, sort of her, her, uh, her wings, that she, I think she kind of she settled down in, in Sion Hill. And the amount of people who went through uh, that school with her, I know that um, if I mentioned Kathleen Watkins and Mary O'Hara, of course, and Janet Harbison, whose uh, whose legacy uh, has you know has been has knows no bounds really with the, the amount of students she's had and inspired. But um, Deirdre O'Callaghan, all these all these wonderful harp players, all these names you might have uh, heard along the way, but they were all students of Maureen's in uh, in the harp room in or Mrs. Ferreter in uh, in Sion Hill, and I've come across people in so many places. Um, I know I was at a concert in. Uh, in Germany somewhere, and a, a woman, ex, an ex uh, Aer Lingus air stewardess, told, she was, as she called herself at the time, handed me a photograph of my grandmother at the foot of the stairs of, a, of a, a Aer Lingus playing with Paddy Maloney off to, to play somewhere in, um, I think they were in Brittany at the time, but uh, and I discovered that Willie Clancy and my grandmother did a concert together in, uh, in Camp Air in Brittany in 1951. So she was quite the prolific uh, performer, my grandmother, and um, Maureen was the prolific teacher in that sense. They both. Uh, they both performed in the early days, and I know I found um, some some uh, accounts of Maureen talking about the mod in Scotland and the Eisteddfod in Wales, the, the equivalent of our Erachtus festival they all played there. And they were guests of honour at those things indeed. And I know Maureen's uh, accounts were read out on radio in the 1930s by her. I found those scripts of their of those, those little accounts and to see the songs that they were singing then and get a chance to sing them again. And of course, Rogine in the, in the 40s and 50s had a radio programme and then she had her own show on, um, though she was Mamo of course on Dilly No Douse in the 80s, anybody uh, growing up in Ireland of the 1980s would have seen Dilly No Douse and this was the harp and we were the children around the harp and Mamo was my Mamo for real. So she was, I suppose, I don't know whether she was the first to have a harp on a, on a regular slot on a children's programme ever in Ireland, but it was, a, it was a great old series. Tony McMahon was the, uh, the brainchild behind it, uh, it was his brainchild rather, it was his idea. He was the driving force that created Diddy No Doubt. And uh, anyone who saw Mamo, you could thank her for being Mamo and thank um, uh, Tony McMahon for the idea. And I know Agnes Cohen then present, uh, produced it afterwards and kept kept the uh, kept the spirit alive. And, and really, you know, the, these songs that we learned as kids, I know other people learned them as well, but uh, you take it for granted when they're around you so much. Um, but I know I'll, I'll do one more song for you now. Um, I'll do the one that... Uh, my other party piece, anyone who knows me will know I love singing this song. It was a, it's a Swan Three, it's a lullaby called The Healing Shaheen Mulana Bakhola, or Shaheen Show was also known as. Um, but uh, yeah, I suppose the legacy that they've left behind really is, is, is a wonderful one. I know um, Mary O'Hara, many of the songs she learned from from Maureen Roji, and also from Sean Ogle, from my man's grand uncle on the other side, all the, all the Cork people. Um, but apart from that, I wonder what else I can say about them. They, they had a, they still, they, they still got the amount of people now that I still meet who, who don't know too much about them. So I'm glad to be able to tell them a little bit of a bit extra about where they were from and 
their teacher Caroline Townsend being such a uh, I suppose they're, they're, she was on her own there was no one else teaching it and there were teachers in the convents of course uh, Mother Attracted Coffee you have all these wonderful stories of the heart being you know, the repertoire being kept alive but um, someone like Caroline Townsend her, her um her cup at the fesh coil was for uh, our awe and the tune of come pretty so it's two songs i think with heart accompaniment and of course that was taken over by corn e hay the uh, o'Shea cup for for moyen and rogin and i know my grandmother would present it every year uh, but towards the end it was sad that there were very few people uh, entering the competition and i know it's changed again i know the the flag coil also has um now got a uh, plans to, to bring back in competitions that people can uh, can sing and play harp to their, to their own harp accompaniment and that is a wonderful thing I know my grandmother would be delighted to hear that and she would be delighted that I'm starting to sing a bit now with the harp as well and uh, my own work has been great with, with the likes of Hazel O'Connor and Moya Brennan I've been having to sing more and uh, I know this this maybe she's like wherever she is she's laughing at me now going I told you I told you so you know so if anything else you know, if, if anyone feels like they, they they might want to give it a go I know it got, it got a bit I suppose in the 80s it got a bit um, I know hackneyed is the word maybe, or a bit people just got a bit tired and the fashion changed, but uh, we're bringing it back now anyway. So I'll leave you with a little uh, taster. This is the Swan Three, uh, the, the lullaby, the Chilin Shahin, Madame of Rocco, or uh, Shahin Show, which just means Hush a Bye or Rock a Bye. So Shahin Show. <laughs>
A very happy heart day to you all in Ireland from a very chilly autumnal Portland, Oregon. And on the 300th birthday anniversary of the man himself, Turlock O'Carolyn, I'll play a little ditty of his for you now. This is uh, Loftus Jones, you all know it, from this side of the pond over to you there. <laughs> 